Lewis, would that have been a red flag for you that they said they were raised by wolves? Immediate red flag, yes, <laughs> complete bull. I would not buy that for a second. Misha DeFonseca is the focus of Netflix's new true crime documentary, Misha and the Wolves. And today on Where Are They Now, I, Adam Andrews, am gonna talk about her. So let's get into it. Misha DeFonseca, born Monique de Waal, is a writer and author from Etterbeek, Belgium, born on the 12th of May, 1937. In 1997, Misha wrote a best-selling memoir titled Misha, A Memoir of the Holocaust Years, with ghostwriter Vera Lee and published by Mount Ivy Press. The memoir told of DeFonseca's true account of survival after the German forces had invaded Belgium during World War II. According to the memoir, DeFonseca's parents were taken under arrest by the German forces for being a part of the Belgian resistance, leaving Misha, who was then a child, to fend for herself in the occupied country. The story continues that at the age of just eight years old, Misha wandered across Europe searching for her parents. During her travels in the wilderness, the memoir claimed that the child was taken care of by a pack of friendly wolves that fed her scraps of meat. The memoir also told of Defonsiga sneaking in and out of the ghetto in Warsaw, taking the life of a German soldier in self-defense and even finding her way back home when the war was done and over in September of 1945. It was an incredible tale told by Misha DeFonseca at a Holliston, Massachusetts synagogue on Yom Heshoah, Israel's Holocaust Remembrance Day and heard by Jane Daniel, who was a local book publisher who ran Mount Ivy Press. Jane suggested that DeFonseca publish the tale as her memoir. The memoir itself became an instant success in Europe and was translated into a total of 18 languages. The French retelling of the memoir, whose title was changed and translated to Surviving with Wolves, was even adapted into a French film of the same name. Speaking of France, DeFonseca even toured the country to promote her memoir with the book selling 30,000 copies. And in Italy, it sold around 37,000 copies. It was an incredibly popular story, an almost unbelievable story. Devon Sika's tale of survival did inspire more doubt than others, and it turns out that those doubts were rightfully placed. Among the first who publicly doubted the book's honesty was a German journalist by the name of Henrik Broder. Broder published an article in 1996 in the German newspaper Der Spiegel that called out the lack of evidence to support Devon Sika's story. A quote from the article reads, quote, Falsehood or not a falsehood? That is the question here. Aside from the existence of a compass allegedly used by Misha, no objective proof exists, and all witnesses who would confirm Misha's story are either dead or disappeared. There is also Maxine Steinberg, who is the leading historian of the tragic historical event in Belgium. Maxine pointed out quite a few historical inaccuracies with Defonseca's memoir, as did forensic genealogists Sharon Sargent and Colleen M. Fitzpatrick. After a legal battle between both Defonseca and Vera Lee, the ghostwriter, against the book's publisher, Jane Daniel, regarding publishing and distributing, that awarded Defonseca $22.5 million and Vera Lee around $11 million, Jane Daniel began to look into the accuracy of the memoir itself. Even Vera Lee had her doubts, which caused her to talk to the nonprofit educational organization Facing History and Ourselves, which, quote, uses lessons of history to challenge teachers and their students to stand up to bigotry and hate. The representative of the organization told Lee that Misha's story was impossible, words which Lee brought to Defonseca, who still stood firm. Lee also learned that Defonseca had burned diaries from her teenage years that contained her story, apparently because the French version of the book told it so well. This came as a surprise to the ghostwriter, who had no idea these diaries even existed, and was never given access to them during the writing of the memoir, which you gotta think she would have been. As I said before, the book publisher even began to question the accuracy of the book, and by 2007 and 2008, she was working to prove its inaccuracy, even owning a blog about the subject. This blog is where Jay and Daniel would post a registry from a school near Misha's family home that showed she had enrolled in 1943, which directly contradicted the memoir, as this was two years after Defonseca had claimed to leave Brussels on her journey across the continent. But Jane also posted a baptism certificate 
from a Brussels church for one Monique de Waal, which was the birth name of Misha de Fonseca, which also contradicted the memoir as it lists her birth year as 1937, which would make the survivor four years old at the time of her parents being taken away when the memoir claims she was eight at the time. All this evidence was gathered by a team led by Sharon Sargent and Colleen M. Fitzpatrick, the genealogists, who worked to uncover the hoax that is Misha de Fonseca's memoir. And on the 29th of February 2008, Misha and her lawyers, when confronted with this evidence by Belgian newspaper Le Soir, admitted that Misha, a memoir of the Holocaust years, was a work of fiction. During the interview, De Fonseca said, and I quote, It's not the true reality, but it is my reality. There are times when I find it difficult to differentiate between reality and my inner world. I ask forgiveness for all those who feel betrayed, but I beg them to put themselves in the shoes of a little four-year-old girl who had lost everything, who must survive, who plunges into an abyss of loneliness, and to understand that I never wanted anything other than to ward off my suffering. Yes, my name is Monique de Waal, but I have wanted to forgive it since I was four years old. Misha or Monique added a bit later, quote, ever since I can remember, I felt Jewish. What is the true story of the real Misha de Fonseca? Well, we now know she was born Monique de Waal and was the daughter of Roman Catholic parents. Her parents were, in fact, arrested for being resistance members, both of whom were deported and later passed away thanks to the German governing party at the time, whose name I'm not allowed to say thanks to YouTube rules before you say something in the comments. Back to the story though, De Fonseca's father was named Robert, and during his interrogation by the Germans, he gave up the names of fellow resistance fighters in exchange for seeing his family for the last time. For that reason, De Fonseca, before changing her name, was known as the quote, traitor's daughter around her hometown, causing the embarrassment surrounding her name. Both her parents passed away in the infamous German camps alongside many, many others. Misha then lived with her grandparents and then later her uncle and his family, which is when she became passionate about wolves and began to quote, feel Jewish. The journey across Europe to find her missing parents and being taken care of by uncharacteristically friendly wolves were both made up by the author. After the truth of her memoir officially came to light, a Massachusetts court ordered that De Fonseca repay her publisher, Jane Daniel, of Mount Ivy Press the $22.5 million she had been awarded in the legal dispute. Before the controversy surrounding the memoir came to light, De Fonseca was supposed to appear on the Oprah Winfrey show as part of Oprah's book club, and was even set to be interacting with a live wolf. As you can imagine, De Fonseca cancelled this particular appearance. Currently, Misha De Fonseca and her husband Maurice live in Massachusetts after moving to the United States from Paris in 1988. The story of her memoir and its discovery as a sham and a hoax is covered in detail in a Netflix true crime documentary called Misha and the Wolves. Misha declined to be interviewed for said documentary. There's a quote from Point of View magazine director Sam Hopkinson that sums up why this was such a controversial and interesting story, if it wasn't already obvious. What's fascinating in this case is that the story Misha was telling was pretty out there or over the top on many levels, but what fascinated was that she was telling it from the perspective of being a survivor, so it was less to do with whether the story seemed believable and more to do with the fact that it was very difficult to challenge it given that she was saying she had gone through this terrible experience in her past. And it's true. How do you call someone a liar for a story taking place during such a destructive and evil event in history when it stands alongside other true tales of survival? But what did you think of Misha or Monique's story? Have you watched the Netflix documentary? Are you going to? Let me know your answers to all these questions in the comments below, but for now, I have been your host, Adam Andrews, here at Where Are They Now? Don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe and well informed out there, and thanks for watching.